we speak wisdom amongst them that are mature. So they can understand the objectivity of truth from the subjectivity of our sentimental attachments. That's why it's important for us to understand the full spectrum so that we can see how God sees. As a scientist, I understand that white light is made up of seven different lights. White light has seven different colors. If it were separated, like you see in the rainbow, when the light of the sun passes through the water body in the cloud, it separates into various colors. That's what you call the rainbow. And you discover what you call white light has green in it. What you call white light has red in it. You can carry that red and run with it and say this is all there is about light. But God is not seeing it that way. So it's important for us to understand truth, not just verses of scriptures. This is why we are doing this teaching we are doing. And we'll try as much as possible to examine it through different spiritual engagements, spiritual operations to help us understand it and to understand it thoroughly. So three things that will form our objective. Like I said last week, Sunday number one is from Mark 16 verse 15. We'll read that and then I'll give you two other objectives before I, I delve into the topic of tonight. Quickly, we are looking at the subject of the gospel. And tonight, we are examining the gospel in the light of spiritual realities. On Sunday, we tagged it understanding the gospel. But tonight, we are dealing with examining the gospel in the light of spiritual realities. I mentioned a few of it on Sunday, but I just want to delve into it a bit further. Jesus speaking in Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So Jesus said, every one of us should preach the gospel. By implication, it means every one of us must understand the gospel. Because if he gave it to us as a commission, that we should preach it to the world, we have to know it to preach it. Number two, having understood it, he expects us to preach it. He expects us to express it. He ex expects us to, to live it. So one is to know it. Number two is to live it. Either by preaching, by acting, or by expressing it. And then number three is to express it to every creature. And when we deal with the kingdom in context, you understand that every creature is part of God's eternal plan. The animals, the plants are part of God's eternal plan. So God expects that every creature should hear the gospel. So the first objective of the gospel or of this teaching is for everyone to come into an accurate understanding of what the gospel is. The second objective is for everyone to become active in expressing the gospel or living the gospel. And then the third is to fortify you with discernment. Because we are in the world of falsehood, we are in the world of deception. If you don't understand the gospel, your life will be full of ups and downs. Your life will be full of puzzles. Your life will be full of crises that you can't explain and issues you cannot resolve. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16. Check that. Let's read it quickly. No, let's look at verse 15. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let's look at verse 14. There's a point. Yes. He said that henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine or by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So there are two things. If you don't understand the gospel, you will not be fortified with discernment. And if you are not fortified with discernment, every season you will discover that you follow every trend that emerges. So if today everybody is saying, I am Christ, you join it. Tomorrow, if they wake up and they say you have to labor, you join labor. Tomorrow, if they wake up, there's anything that comes up, you just flow and navigate with trends. You will not be established. And that you do it with high emotion does not mean you know what you are doing. Have you seen some Christians in the last 10 years? 
they followed more than four moves before already. When the, the move of prosperity shows up, everybody is, begins to confess who they are in Christ, what they are in Christ. And then after a while, prayer move begins. And they say, it's not about confession. They begin to labor in prayer. And they say, it's about prayer. It's about stature. And you find them doing that. When another move comes, they will still move. If you notice them in all of these seasons, they are doing it with excitement. But you discover their life is in the cycle. Because the one they are doing now, they don't understand it. They are just carried away. That's what the Bible is warning us against. That you are not moved to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And the danger is that underneath all of this move is the craftiness of men. He said they lie in wait to deceive. Because if you do that for a while and you are not established in truth and you are not doing what you are doing from the place of revelation, you will discover that after three years, after four years, after five years, the person who is leading the move will become big. You will now see the many followers who were fighting for that move. They are still in oblivion. They are still in obscurity. They are not going to amount to anything. And if you take time to study all of these moves, you will see it that is true. Go and check most of the captains of the different moves that thousands of people follow and they are doing it. After five years, the person leading the move becomes a big man. The others, somebody met me the other day and was angry. Say, can you imagine this pastor? It was on this my head that we carried blocks to build this church. Now to even see him is a problem. He doesn't even act as if he remembers my name anymore. I said, well, when they were doing what they were doing, you weren't functioning from revelation. You were just carried away by emotion. That's why you didn't become big. So it's important to understand truth so that anything you are doing, you are doing from the standpoint of revelation. Tomorrow, don't blame anybody. And you see the problem. When you start telling people to take caution because they are overly excited about what is happening, they think you are an enemy. They insult you. It's many years later, you look at them still where they were. Sometimes even worse. They will shake their head and say, my brother, this thing no easy. <laughs> my brother. They will discover that thing they were doing was emotion. So, the third reason why this is important is to fortify yourself with discernment. So that whatever you do, at the end, you will grow in it and you will become relevant in God's agenda. Now, before I delve into what I want to teach tonight, I will just do a quick recap to remind us of the things we have touched already. This teaching will take two months or more because we will tear them into compartments and deal with them one by one to help us understand and to understand thoroughly. But let's do a recap. We began on Sunday by defining what the gospel is. And I said the gospel has three major root words. One in the Greek and two in the Hebrew. I said the gospel in the Greek is from the word euangelion. And I said euangelion is a compound word made of you and angelion. You simply means good. And angelion simply means message. So the gospel is good message or good news in a simplistic sense. But you see this good news it's not just any kind of good news, like I said. Because when you trace it to his Hebrew origin, it's from the word Bisar and also from the word Bisora. And the word Bisora is a good news that is a royal declaration that brings about liberty. That's the nature of good news. A decree from a king that has the authority to execute and to prosecute liberty and deliverance. And I gave us one of the scriptures that captures the totality of the gospel in the gospel of Isaiah. Isaiah 52 from verse 7. I showed you the word, the, the word there. It says, how beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of them that bring it, of him that bring it good tidings. That's good news. That's the word besora. And it said that published peace that bring it good tidings of good. You are seeing that it's not just a good news. It's a good news of good. So the good in this news is abundant. That publisheth salvation and that saith unto Zion, thy God. 
reign it. Thy God reign it. So, it's a message, a royal declaration to a people of liberty, of peace, of good, of salvation, that God is going to reign over them. And I told you the context in which this message was published. Because if you were not there, you wouldn't understand this. These guys just came out of slavery from the nation of Babylon. So they were oppressed. They were tormented. In fact, they were, they were living like less of human beings. They got some of their males and castrated them. If they want you to, to guard a queen or a princess, they castrate you. That's how dehumanized they were. So most of the prophets you heard like Daniel, they were eunuchs, they were castrated. So they dehumanize you to a point where you have no right. And suddenly, God brings you the news that you have not just come out of Babylon, that God will become your God. You will become his people. He will become your father. He will become your supplier. He will become your defender. So God is literally telling you everything you have been through. He is going to wipe it away and you will not remember it anymore. It's like changing your status from a slave to becoming a prince. And not just a prince, but an heir apparent. One who is an heir of a kingdom. And in order to drive the, the message home, I gave you a natural illustration. Assuming we're not talking Christianity, and then you are a young man, maybe from one of the poor regions of Africa. To have gari to drink is a body. Now, you know, there are some people who don't know the word gari. Because of where they live, the realm where they operate. That word itself, they will have to say, what, what, what is Gary? <laughs> the word Gary itself is strange to them. Gary, you have to start explaining to them how cassava is processed to have Gary. Because of the realm where they operate. Now, you, if you at the level where you are, maybe if you have Gary, it's serious breakthrough. Very serious breakthrough. They now pick you from that level. And now, assuming we are not talking Christianity, I'm painting the picture because somebody will hear this now and say, no, that's not a good example. He should have you. I'm trying to paint a natural illustration because good news. Do you get what I'm saying? So you pick somebody who considers having Gary to drink for one day as breakthrough. And you suddenly tell him that, sorry, um, the person they told you is your father is actually your guardian. Is not your father. When you were born, Something happened, so they, they just had to bring you to this place. But now they want to take you to your real family. And what do you mean? He'll, he'll be angry. What do you mean? I love my father. I love, uh, you know, all those emotional attachments. They now say, well, uh, sorry, your, your father is the king of Dubai. He will say, really, um, are you trying to say this is my guardian? Now, forget the, emo the emotional attachment and all of that. Forget, that's not my point. But this person you are talking about now, you can't see him the way you are. Imagine they tell you your father is a king and is a king that has so much wealth. His problem is how to spend it. Now, if you know the way these people live, you will understand what I'm saying. Let me give you an idea. Like I said the last time, some of them, if they are buying cars, every color of clothes they wear there's a car that matches it that's how they dress so the car the car is part of dressing and what i'm talking about here is not v boot it's not moto it's car so they have cars that match their dress and they don't just have cars that match their dress they have different brands of car for all of these colors so if they want a Bugatti, they maybe they get five Bugatti Verons. They have pepper red, they have ash, they have white, they have black. So that when they dress, if it's Bugatti they want to walk in that month, they have different Bugattis. Now, these cars I'm talking to you, one of them is over $2.5 million. Do the mathematics. To give you an idea of what we are talking about. That's not all. So they have the section of Bugatti. They have another section of Ferraris. So you see Ferrari Spider. They, they, they say the way the car looks like. They, they, they love it. With many horsepowers. And those ones too have many colors. Now, apart from that one, they now have Rolls Royce. You see Rolls Royce Phantom. Different colors. 
That, that is car. So when they carry you to where cars are, only cars will be like $500 million. Those are cars. Then they go to watches. It's not this type I'm wearing. Have you heard of a watch called Philippe Patik? Those type of watches, sometimes one of them can be $17 million. One watch. Some of them, one is $10 million. So they have them in the collections. Those are the kind of watches they use. Then they live there. You enter their mansion. If you enter some of their rooms, I told you, you will not find mahogany. The wood you find there is ebony. And ebony wood is more expensive than some of the silvers you have. Ebony. That's what they use for chairs and wood in the house. So a building alone will be in millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Then because they travel, they don't want to miss their home. So they move the mansion to the air. They now buy private jet. And when they buy a private jet, the first thing they do is to remove everything that is in the private jet and customize it to their taste. So they have beds in the jet. They have everything that they have in their houses in the jet. And it's not still normal wood. Some of this jet, everything inside is gold plated. I saw the other one, they said he has a Range Rover that is gold plated. He has a Bugatti that is gold plated. I say, ah, ah. So it's not even color again. They use gold to color it. Real gold. The gold that you have one ring. You say, I'm married. The car is gold. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> now, because sometimes they also move on water. They now have yachts. So they move the mansion to the air. They move the mansion to the water. And one yacht will be around 200 million. They now tell you, this is your father. So sorry that you have, for the past 30 years, you were drinking Gary. Come home. <laughs> Come home. And they say, don't worry. We know you have. Come home. Come home. Everything will be fine. Before you come home, you now want to go. They say, wait. They brought you a gift. You need to change. They give you a watch. You now see the watch. You now check it online. When you check, you now discover the price of the watch is $6 million. You will start crying. 